Thank you very much, everybody. Can be. Good question. Um, it can be. I think so. Yeah. There's your answer. Yeah. There's nothing in there that's too sensitive. So, uh, but I think what you're going to be seeing today is is some information that you you, you probably haven't been aware of uh, before. It's relatively new, and it has been amassed over the last uh, couple of years. But as as the as the title states, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of a lot of controversy around this particular activity. We know how important it is to our economy. We also know how. Uh, critical it can be to uh, to the environment, um, but um, you know it's a world class uh, project uh, right in our backyard. So we're actually quite lucky as a province to have something of this nature so close by to to benefit from and to learn from um, as we go forward. Um, and so what I'm going to present today is just about bringing a little bit of context to the discussion or the debate around the oil sands and its development and, how, and understanding the role of, of humans uh, versus natural systems. And I think it's really important when we're looking at these types of things to um, look at all aspects of it um, so we have a full appreciation and we can make some, some very informed decisions and some judgments. But there, so I'm, you know, the oil sands is, is very far downstream from, uh, from the headwaters. As we know, the headwaters are up in Jasper, uh, the Athabasca Glacier uh, is the headwaters of the, of the river, the Athabasca River. So there's a lot of things that are actually happening upstream of the oil sands that, that do need to be taken into consideration. Um, we, we know that gla glaciers are receding. Uh, this is nothing new. Um, and uh, that has serious implications for river flows at certain times of the year. We also know that the snowpacks are changing as well. And so, you know, the river flows aren't constant. They, they vary over time and, uh, and space. So, so therefore, these are considerations for water quantity, and we know that the oil sands is one activity that does use a lot of water, so, so does agriculture. Um, but we know that going forward into the future that some of this water may not be available. There's also coal mining that's occurring up in, up in the uh, upper headwaters and around Hinton. Uh, we know that, uh, that, that uh, there, there can be some challenges around uh, coal mining operations with respect to water quality, in particular trace elements like selenium, uh, potentially arsenic, uh, that might be uh, being liberated from some of the sulfide minerals that are typically incorporated in these, uh, these deposits. And so these contaminants can make their way in, into, the, uh, into the system. We have forestry, logging, uh, linear developments, roads, uh, you know, clear cuts, block, uh, cut blocks. You know, the, these can alter the uh, the, uh, the hydrology of, of basins, uh, change runoff coefficients, uh, uh, siltation of rivers, all of these types of things. So these are this is another component that can influence uh, what effectively reports to to the Athabasca River. When you think of a basin, it's actually the integration of everything that's happening within that area, that watershed that's reporting down to to a river, so it kind of gives you an, a, a, an idea of, of everything that's happening through the basin. There's a number of pulp and paper mills, uh, crap uh, pulp and paper mills along the, uh, the Athabasca River that are discharging uh, wastewater into the river, um, and that's being assimilated into the system. So we know that, that there are you know, uh, uh, chlorinated uh, compounds and, and all kinds of things that can be going into the system just, just from the, the, the discharges from these facilities. Agriculture, this is huge for the province. Um, maybe not a big generator of GDP, but, but certainly a big part of our, our, uh, our uh, um, sectoral mix of activities. Uh, we do know that the, the, you know, the, uh, the, the growing of food comes with some, some challenges as well. We, we need to use water, obviously, to, to irrigate some of these crops, but we also need to apply, you know, pesticides that can work their way into the, uh, into the food chain, uh, endocrine disruptors, and all these types of things that, that can create their own issues with respect to uh, water bodies and, and, and uh, things that work their way up to trophic levels in the food chain. We have municipal wastewater discharges, uh, you know, Obviously, big cities like Calgary, uh, Edmonton have, have large facilities. We do know that there are a lot of uh, settlements along the Athabasca River that are discharging their, their uh, municipal wastewater into, these, uh, into the Athabasca River. So uh, stormwater and, and sewage, these are two things that can have a lot of 
trace elements in them or, or chlorinated solvents, things like that, that actually don't get broken down in the, uh, the, the, uh, the systems, the treatment systems. And so these are uh, other contaminants that are working their way into the, uh, into the system. <clears throat> Obviously, the oil sands is another activity. It's, it's, it's a large-scale activity. Um, but again, the, the point being that it's not the only activity that's occurring. And, and again, it's quite a bit further downstream. And then finally, we've got uh, activities like the Gunnar Mine up on Lake Athabasca, just on the Saskatchewan side, a uranium mine uh, that uh, operated until a few decades ago. Um, you know, we, we do know that, uh, that there were uh, some effects around this mine. I mean, uh, some of the uranium uh, tailings were actually pushed into Athabasca Lake uh, back in the day before we, we were really sort of environmentally conscious. And um, so... That kind of takes you all the way down through the watershed and, and gives you an idea of how, how busy it is. But there are also a number of complicating factors, so it's not just human influence here that, that can be uh, uh, working its way into the system. We have a number of natural things that are happening. So the Athabasca River itself has carved down through the oil sands. We, this is a picture of, a, of, a, of an outcrop showing some bitumen that's actually just literally flowed down to the river. It's, it's, it's not flowing, it's, it's flowed down to, and it's interacting, as you can see, with the river water. So, so we are getting hydrocarbons going directly into the river from natural means. We also know that the, the river is, is uh, interacting with some very old formations, the Devonian formations, which contain very saline waters. And so we, now we've got mixing between the waters of these natural formations and the river. And finally, we, you know, the area, the area is, is, is covered with a lot of muskeg, uh, bogs and fens and sphagnum moss. Uh, these are very, very rich in organics, uh, and some of the humic and fulvic substances can be quite effective in leaching metals out of soils and, and moving them into the environment. So one needs to look at both sides of this equation, the natural system and the influences that we may be having on it, and try to bring some, some context to you know, the, and balance to that, uh, that discussion. And then, of course, we know how this all ends up, right? You know, you know we've seen a lot of this in the press. Um, a lot of people worried about what's going on, maybe jumping to some conclusions, maybe not having all the information. Um, you know, as a scientist and a, and a consultant, you know, um, you know, my job is to get all the facts before I render a, a, a decision and, and not try to spin anything politically. Um, you know, we're trying to inform the decision makers in the best way that we can. So this type of stuff isn't very helpful, although it, it may be helpful from the standpoint of keeping it uh, in the front of people's minds and things that we need to look at and try to understand. So the, the area itself, I'm now going to focus just on what I call the Lower Athabasca uh, River, which is basically from the, the city of Fort McMurray downstream. And it's a fairly, fairly complex setting. What we can see is uh, in, the, in the red arrows, this is basically, we've got the Clearwater River that, that flows in from Saskatchewan. This is the Athabasca River coming up uh, from, uh, from Athabasca. And it basically flows out to the north, uh, eventually discharges into the Peace Athabasca Delta, a very large uh, inland freshwater delta. Uh, and that, and then, uh, that becomes the, uh, the, the Slave River system. The Peace River flows in, Lake Athabasca feeds in. At the Basque River feeds in, and then it flows out into the uh, Mackenzie system through the through the slave. The blue arrows are indicating just conceptually the groundwater flow directions. Um, so you can see that they're not just uh, sim simple, uh, but the point being that that the the Athabasca River Valley acts as a regional drain or discharge area. So we have water originating and recharging in these in these upland areas here. Uh, and eventually working its way down and, and, and discharging out in, into the river. Uh, the same thing happens with the clear water as well. Um, so we can see that the, you know, the flow patterns can be somewhat complex, uh, you know, radial to subradial from these, these upland areas. And we also know that you know, from the geology, so we show the, uh, that the Athabasca River is actually carved down into this, this blue material here is, is Devonian. And this sort of uh, orangey looking material is the McMurray Formation. And the McMurray Formation is the oil sands formation. It's the one that, that cont contains the bitumen. 
So, so the, the Athabasca River and, uh, and to some degree, you know, the, uh, the tributaries, the small tributaries that flow in like the Mackay or the, the Ells River or the Steep Bank or the Muskeg have similarly eroded down through this material and, in, and incorporated some of this material into the river sediments and eventually this material moves its way downstream uh, and where do things go to deposit? They go deposit in deltas. And so, you know, we've got the Peace Athabasca Delta, which is a big repository of a, lo a lot of this uh, material that's been eroded over, over thousands of years. Now, looking at, uh, you know, the basin-wide synoptic patterns with respect to water quality. So we're starting again, you know, from the headwaters in Hinton. We've got these four stations, Athabasca, Fort McMurray, and Old Fort. And we're showing the geology here. So we have the foreland uh, basin here, which is you know, comprised of carbonates and clastics. Uh, we've got the Devonian Silurian, which, which, which again is, is uh, uh, carbonates and, and uh, evaporites. We've got the prairie evaporites here uh, of the Elk Point Basin. And then there's the Precambrian Basement and the Canadian Shield up to the north. This is some work that, uh, that Scott Giseco with uh, Alberta Innovates Technology Futures had done. I thought it would be quite informative here, showing changes in chloride concentrations in the river water as you move downstream from the headwaters. So you can see at the headwaters it's quite fresh, as it should be. It's, it's the melting of snow and ice, which is fairly clean, uh, and a chloride content of, of one milligram uh, per liter or part per million or less. And then you can see as you move downstream, you start picking up chlorides, two, three, and then all of a sudden you get to Fort McMurray, down to Old Fort, and you increase from about three milligrams per liter chloride to about 25. Now that is a, that is a huge increase when you take into consideration the flow of the river. There's anywhere uh, at Fort McMurray about 650 cubic meters per second of flow on average goes past the town of uh, the city of Fort McMurray. So to see an increase in chloride from three to 25 is, is, is large, very large indeed. So, minor chloride input upstream of Fort McMurray, significant chloride input downstream. Prairie evaporites. We know that the prairie evaporites have been dissolving over time, uh, and this salt has to go somewhere. So the meteoric waters that were either have been infiltrating over time since these formations have been exposed, um, or, or the glaciers when they were uh, riding over the air were actually pushing water into these formations. Remember, we had about a kilometer and a half of ice, and that's a significant hydraulic head. You know, 1,500 meters uh, of, of ice, and, and a water head of that is, is 15 megapascals. That, that's a lot of pressure, pushing water in. So this is fresh meteoric water, and salt has a high solubility. And of course, the salt's going to dissolve, right? But the salt has to go somewhere. So using chloride, chloride mass balancing, some, some estimates have been made on the amount of, of saline water that's been put into the system from, by natural means. Uh, and the estimates are up to 3 cubic meters a second, which is about 259 million liters per day. So that's, that's a lot of liters. If we take a, a bit of a, a, a focus now on, on just the, uh, the, uh, the downstream part from Fort McMurray, what I'm showing here is zone one, zone two, zone three, up to, to zone seven. These are some zones that we actually went to to actually do some sampling because we wanted to uh, get samples out of, the, out of, the, out of the, either the, the river water itself or from the river sediments in, in, in the zone where, where, the, where the surface water and, and the groundwater interact, which is called the hyperreic zone. But what I'm showing you here is just the river water. So we see that, that basically from um, the, uh, the, the, the town of Fort McMurray, or city of Fort McMurray, this is looking at just total dissolved solids and mineralization. It really goes from about 135 to about 100 and maybe 150 uh, down to the zone three, which is right here, and then we see a big jump. So it looks like there's a lot of action that might be happening in that part. So now we're actually starting to focus into where we might be seeing some of the biggest groundwater, surface water interactions occurring. And, and, uh, and, and by the way, I mean, most of the action has been up here. And one thing you need to keep in mind is the oil sands may have been around for the last 40 years or so, 
but mo but most of the activity, other than Syncrude and, and Suncor, Suncor started about 1969, Syncrude started about 1972, and then there was a big gap until about 2001 when the next mine came, which was Albion Sands, which is this one right here. So the oil sands ha haven't been around looking like this for 40 years. It's been, a, it's been a temporal, there's been a temporal dimension to this. If we look at uh, some of these other uh, constituents like sulfate and strontium, which are really good indicators of, of uh, limestone type formations or Devonian sources, we see great increases uh, from down, down, upstream to downstream and then a leveling off as we get around by the zone four, zone three. So that gives you an idea of, of what's happening in, in the river itself. Well, what's happening in the river sediments? Well, we went out, we obviously did some, some multi-level sampling in, in some of these zones. We took temperature readings. Uh, we collected water for ke chemical measurements, major ions, secondary trace elements, stable and radi radiogenic isotopes uh, to understand uh, and fingerprint these waters. But the temperature profiles were very revealing. At these two zones, zones one and zone three, you, you see that the profiles really kind of flatten out as they get closer to the surface, as opposed to these upstream, which are showing a much more steep incline. Now, when you have groundwater discharge, when you have groundwater moving up, it actually brings heat with it. The groundwater temperature is, is fairly stable over time, and the air temperature obviously fluctuates. So we're looking at, at the time of year we did this in October, we were looking at air temperatures of about maybe four to six degrees Celsius, and the groundwater is at about nine degrees Celsius. So a really good indicator of, of upward flow. And really, when you look at the magnitude of these profiles and how they, how they manifest themselves, you get an idea of flux. You can't measure it with temperature directly, but you get a, it's a qualitative indication. So we have relatively higher discharge flux, in this downstream area as opposed to upstream. So now we're really starting to focus in on where, where the action is between Fort McMurray and Old Fort. So in addition to, uh, you know, in, in order to identify the stations we went to, uh, we wanted to go to, we employed a, a technique called electromagnetic imaging or a geophysical technique. So it's a survey, basically a waterborne survey uh, effectively a, a, a boat with an EM31 tool strapped to the hull um, and basically driving up and down the river uh, taking readings of, of uh, salinity or, or terrain conductivity. And tr it's, a, it's a bulk measurement of the sediment and the pore water. But all things being equal, the river sediment being it, it, the way it is, fairly, fairly homogeneous, although there are heter heterogeneities, um, effectively what you're, what you're mapping is salinity, pore water salinity. And what you see in, in some of these areas is some very, very, these, these uh, uh, hot pink and, and red areas are areas of high salinity, soil salinity, or terrain conductivity. So what you see is, is a very large area here and another area here. This is 15 kilometers long, just to give you a, a bit of a scale. So it's very, very large uh, feature. Uh, this in itself is, is probably about seven kilometers long. Um, it is close into some of these mines, uh, and one could be led to the conclusion that, oh my God, we've got a big uh, saline discharge happening in the river from these mines. Uh, but you know, these, the fact that this seepage is well downstream of any activity is quite compelling, actually, from a, from, uh, from a natural perspective. When we actually look at the water quality from the sediments that were, uh, from the pore waters that were collected from the sediments from multiple levels down to about three meters, we see uh, mineralization or TDS values up to 65,000 milligrams per liter TDS, or almost two times seawater. We also see significant concentrations of ammonia, up to four and a half milligrams per liter, which is certainly detrimental to fish in aquatic habitat. Uh, we see naphthenic acids uh, up to about 2.3 milligrams per liter. Uh, naphthenic acids being a very uh, character, uh, characteristic constituent of, of oil sands processing but oil sands in general. And uh, in some cases, we're seeing uh, elevated concentrations of arsenic up to 16 micrograms per liter. Uh, just for uh, perspective, the, the freshwater uh, uh, guideline, uh, or freshwater aquatic guideline is five. So that's three times the aquatic guideline. Then we move uh, a little bit further upstream uh, and we see that we've got, uh, you know, 
very, very small areas, maybe on the orders of a few hundreds of meters, not kilometers, but hundreds of meters. But still, we're seeing, we're seeing these, uh, these areas of elevated train conductivity. Now, what's very interesting is we've got a very large tailing structure here, and we've got elevated train conductivity. Now, one would be led, again, to believe that the tailings pond is the reason. However, when we actually go in and we start looking at this a bit more closely with our fingerprinting tools, we actually came to, came to a different conclusion. What we see here uh, is uh, concentrations upwards of 27,000 milligrams per liter, this time of elevated ammonia and, and naphthenics, but 41 micrograms per liter arsenic. So now we're eight times the aquatic guideline. Interestingly enough, there's a lake here called Saline Lake. It's called Saline Lake for a reason. Um, there's, a, there's a mound spring right here that feeds into this, this lake. This lake, the, the concentration of the fresh water in that lake, is, is, uh, the, the TDS is 2,500, which is, is, is one and a half orders of magnitude what you, what, what's in the river. So, so this is a lake that is receiving natural discharge from a Devonian spring right here. So interesting, complex system that we're dealing with, and, and, and it and really behooves us to understand it before we start making statements about the things that we might be doing to the environment. Not saying that we may not be impacting it, we probably are. I'm trying to understand to what degree and what role that nature plays here. So source identification, very, very simple cross plot of, of sulfate and chloride. You start seeing some very interesting things when you start taking the regional groundwater here from the McMurray Formation and the Devonian, these little pluses and, and open circles, you start seeing how they plot out and we start seeing that our, our, our uh, pore waters from our river actually fall within these, these groupings of, of, of water types. And you start seeing some really interesting patterns. Again, Devonian waters, these are our downstream uh, stations, stations uh, one, five and three. Uh, the stations upstream, uh, more associated with McMurray formation. On a very, very simple cross plot, this is, you can go into quite sophisticated uh, analysis if you want to, but you're not really going to refine the picture that much more than actually showing that you've got some really, really nice groupings that actually line up with the geology quite nicely. But of course, we've got activity, and, and I think what's really, really important is that we need to place that activity in, into its proper perspective. In my business, we tend to look at things from a risk management perspective. We try to understand risk and manage it accordingly using, using science and engineering. So I consider myself, I came from a science background, but I consider myself more of a risk manager, using science and engineering as the tools to help me manage that risk. So from a classic uh, environmental standpoint, it's a source. You need to have a source uh, or a hazard to the environment. You need to have an open and active pathway for things to move through the subsurface towards a receptor. And you need to have a receptor that is sensitive, sensitive to change, because not all receptors are sensitive. They might be vulnerable, but they may not be sensitive to change. They might be able to take that hit, assimilate it, and move on. But if, they, if it's hit too hard, that's where you start having effects. You need to have all three of these. The nexus is, is the risk. If, you, if you're missing any one of those, you don't have a risk scenario, really, to, to a receptor. So when we actually start looking at some of these tailings ponds, you start getting some interesting information. For example, this particular structure here, uh, south, uh, south tailings pond at, on Suncor's lease, has actually only been around since 2007. Um, I believe the Department of Civil Engineering has been doing some research on it, Dr. Anya Ulrich uh, and her team have been looking at this particular structure because they monitor it from day one, before they even put fluids in it, and they're watching how things change over time. Uh, as well, this structure has a, a, a hydraulic containment around it, so the water is actually pumped out of uh, channels, and put back in the pond. So it's actually closed circuit. It's sitting on top of shale. There's no pathway. So it really actually doesn't have any connectivity to the river. And I could go through all these ponds, but what I will say is the majority of these ponds actually are either too far away from the river, there hasn't been enough time for things to move from point A to point B, the monitoring isn't showing that it's getting there, 
But yet, we jump to the conclusion, and I'll tell you, visually, it, it's not appealing, visually, for sure. But from a subsurface perspective, we can't get things to the river, like people have been saying, from all these structures. But nonetheless, we have things being published by, by uh, watchdog organizations. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this. I'm very intimate with it. 11 million liters a day. This is what has been estimated reporting into the Athabasca River from, the, from all the tailings ponds. Well, how did they come to that number? Um, this was the Pemina Institute that, that, uh, that helped out the environmental defense here. They literally just went back to everybody's environmental impact assessments, took the estimates of seepage that people had reported in their EIAs, added it up, and reported it to the river. They just said everything's going to the river. They didn't actually look at the source, the, the pathway aspect of this, um, which is quite important, as I've pointed out. I mean, not everything is interacting with the river like people think it is. But 11 million liters a day, now keep that in context, because I showed that there was like 260 million liters a day of natural seepage going in. So 11 million liters a day is 0.13 cubic meters per second. 0.13 cubic meters per second versus three meters per second of, of natural saline is only 4%. And that's assuming it all gets there. Uh, and we know that that's probably not completely true, but, but that's just to provide a little bit of context again. We gotta keep these things in perspective. So I guess in the end, like what do we know? What, what do we know about this area? Well, we know we've got s significant areas of natural input. That's for sure. We, we, we physically sampled them. We've imaged them. Uh, we know we've got exposed oil sands along the river that have, have been depositing hydrocarbons into the river sediments and moving them downstream. We've got bedrock waters that are saline. We've got muskeg drainage. We've got a lot of natural contaminants going into the system as well as, as human-induced. We know the waters are of poor quality, uh, and, uh, and they can have some significant concentrations of, of what would be considered deleterious substances. We know that the delivery of these natural contaminants has been occurring for, for thousands of years, at least since the glaciers, the last glaciers left about 10 to 15,000 years ago, and they've been going down and depositing in the Peace Athabasca Delta. That's a given. Uh, compared to human inputs, these, these, these natural contributions would appear to dominate the system. We, uh, we know the relative impacts of human versus nature remains unknown at this point in time. We know a little bit, uh, but we, we, we know less than we, we think we do. And we don't understand the relevance of, of the impacts that we may be having uh, with respect to the natural system itself. And I think, personally, that knowledge is, is pretty key to have a balanced discussion about future development of the oil sands, including closure. Because when you think about it, when we've, when we've completed the activity up there, we're going to reconstitute the landscape and we're going to walk away and hopefully everything grows and, and, and it'll be nice and green and everybody's happy. But uh, there's a lot of things we still don't know uh, going forward because when you think about it, uh, when you close a tailings pond, you cap it, there's still residual material in there that's going to be moving its way into the environment over hundreds or even thousands of years. Well, what does that mean in the context of the natural system as well? So we really, really do need to understand the natural system in order to place our human activity into context with it. Now, I'm not trying to sell, I'm not up here to sell the oil sands. Um, I know how important it is to us, but I also understand how important you know, proper environmental stewardship is. But it has to be predicated on information. And so as Bill alluded to, um, an opportunity came up last year to respond to a, uh, an expression of interest uh, for um, some monies that were be ma being made available by the Alberta Innovates Energy and Environment Solutions uh, under their water sustainability platform. Um, and we responded uh, to the, uh, the, uh, the EOI process on the, uh, because the Alberta Innovates wanted to understand this a bit more. There had been some conversations that were happening, and it, and it manifested itself into this, uh, this EOI. We got through the expression of interest process. They were intrigued by what we had uh, um, put in front of them, including the team. 
And we subsequently went to the full project proposal, which we were successful in, in uh, obtaining funding from Alberta Innovate. Now, that was made contingent on getting um, uh, co-funding from Canada's Oil Sands Innovation Alliance. Uh, this is a consortium right now of 14 oil sands companies, which constitutes about 80 to 85% of the production in the oil sands right now. They, wanted, they, they knew that the industry would greatly benefit from this, and, the, and Alberta Innovates felt that it would be fair enough to, to approach them for, for co-funding. We then went through a process of, of uh, presentations and meetings with COSIA member companies um, and effectively got agreement on our, on our project uh, from seven, seven of the major mining companies, including Suncor and Syncrude and Shell and, and Total, Imperial Oil, all of those. Um, we're still waiting for the, the final uh, uh, participation agreement between Albert Innovates and, and COSIA to be signed which will then trigger the signature of the uh, uh, grant agreement between the University of Alberta and Alberta Innovates. So we're 99.9% .9 of the way there. But this particular study is predicated on answering a couple of questions. What is the relevant, relative impact to the, the ecosystem from recent human developments, I'm saying over the last, let's say, 50 to 100 years, compared to natural contributions that have been persisting for thousands of years? Now, what is the relevance of each? Is it 99% natural and 1% human? Is it 50-50? I mean, until we actually have those numbers, we're really not getting to the, to the point, uh, a very good point in the discussion. Because we're assuming, right? As, as scientists and engineers, we don't assume. We have to get facts, and then we have to you know, make decisions based on those facts. So the study is designed uh, with a number of components. Um, obviously, whenever you embark on any type of uh, research or study of this nature, you need to review what's out there. What's, where's the existing information? We plan on developing a unified database. There's a lot of information in this province. Don't, don't let anybody tell you that there isn't. It just doesn't happen to be in one place, which is a big challenge, but it is there. So once you start unifying this data into a, into a common area, a common database, or a common uh, GIS platform, it becomes very powerful. Uh, we're using this to frame the physical and chemical setting of the lower Athabasca region uh, and, and the biological aspects will be brought into this as well. So a lot of the regional aquatics monitoring program, uh, the long-term river network from Alberta environment, all this data will be amassed into one area. We plan on conducting additional geophysical reconnaissance of, of primarily the tributaries this time to address, uh, and we want to cover off the current uh, human footprint, not just the oil sands. This includes the city of Fort McMurray. So we plan to use the same technology we used previously, this marine-based uh, EM31 imaging. What I'm showing you here is, is this is the existing line of survey, so it covers about 125 kilometers of the river. The plan is to address the tributaries, so we've got you know, a little area coming into, uh, um, from the Athabasca into the, the city of Fort McMurray, the Clearwater. We want to do the Steep Bank River to cover off the, the current mine footprint. This is the Mackay River, the Muskeg River, and the Els. Those are the rivers that will be imaged using geophysics. And then we plan to go back to some of these locations once we've identified where these terrain conductivity anomalies are. And we want to actually do also, you know, do some more sampling, but we want to do some physical measurements. Let's measure the discharge. You know, how much water is actually moving out instead of how much do we think is, and, and just let's get some, some real measurements using techniques like seepage meters, which effectively is just like taking a, the, the top of a 45-gallon drum, sticking it into the sediment, and, and like hooking up a bag to the, 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 the bunghole where you, where you can just collect water over time, and you just measure how much water flowed over the area over time, and now you've got a flux. And when you take that flux and you start using chemistry, now you've got loading. So you've got constituent loading. Now, having said that, there can be a lot of variability, but the plan is to measure enough locations so we can get, get the variability framed as best as we can. But we won't stop there. Uh, we want to look at hydrograph analysis. We want to take river hydrographs and back out the base flow component. This is the groundwater contribution component. And see how that, and see if that matches with the seepage meters, 
or the potential manometers. We want to do chemical mass balances like Scott Giseco did when I showed you the chloride mass balances there. And then groundwater models. And if we take all of these and they more or less align, then I think we've got a good start to understanding how much water is moving in. And then we assess it for its chemical quality and, and try to find some of these fingerprints. We want to find the industrial fingerprint. We want to find the municipal fingerprint. We want to find the natural fingerprint. So we can actually start tearing these numbers apart and saying 10%, 50%, you know, 40% is attributed to you know, these various uh, activities. We want to quantify the organic compounds because we know that there are a lot of natural organics going in. We also know that there may be some, some process, oil sands process related uh, ones going in. Looking at the trace elements, this is what Bill will be doing. Um, and John Martin doing the, the organics and, and looking at some of the organometallic complexes. The plan is to address surface water, the sediment pore water again. We want to mon man, uh, meter some of the springs and, and take some samples out of them, as well as muskeg drainage, because we know that these organic rich waters, I mean, you should see this water, it almost looks like tea. It's so rich in folic and humic substances that I, 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 I bet dollars that there's going to be a lot of metals being conveyed into these streams just, just from the muskeg itself, drainage. So the plan is going forward at least uh, in the next year or so is, is to address information that, you know, go back to stations that we've already measured and confirm them with a much, much higher resolution of, of, of uh, investigation. Uh, go back to some, some springs and, and uh, get some of that water because we haven't done much of that work either. We want to look at uh, municipal. So, you know, right around the, the city, we want stormwater drains, uh, sewage uh, discharge. That's going to have similar types of organics and metals and things. So we want to go back and fingerprint these things, perhaps do some metal isotopes uh, to see if there's differences between, you know, the oil sands metals and, and the metals that are coming out of, uh, out of the, the sewage and, and, the, and the stormwater drains. And then, of course, we want to go back to the tailings ponds get some water either out of the ponds themselves or groundwater from the monitoring wells around the ponds because think about it if we're talking about trying to understand water that may be moving from a tailings pond to the river whatever you're sampling today is not in the river right now it can take you know 30 20 30 years to get there and there's a lot of things that can happen in the subsurface to that water that would actually change it when it gets to the end right so measuring just just pond water isn't all of the all of the information that we need. So which metals to assess? Well, in, in oil sands, there's three primary metals that really stand out. Molybdenum, nickel, and vanadium. And so you want to be studying, if you're looking at oil sands related effects, you want to study metals that are in the oil sand, in the oil sand deposit. You don't want to be studying some, you know, the metals that, that actually aren't in there in big quantities. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But having said that, there are other metals that were, have been flagged in, in other reports, uh, other consultants' reports or other watchdog reports that are of concern and have been measured in, in the Peace South Tabasco Delta sediments. Arsenic is one of them, mercury, and selenium. So we want to we want to align and we want to go back and, and, and verify what others have, have done, or 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 find counter information. Uh, but we also want to be focusing on. The, the primary metals of, of, of interest. Beg your pardon? Be the clear water shale. Yeah, absolutely. The plan is to look at those that are actually dissolved in the water because we know that these metals can be in different uh, species. Uh, they can be associated with particles. Uh, they can, like larger particles, or they can be associated with colloidal sized particles, very, very small particles. Um, how these metals are associated with these different constituents is going to dictate their mobility and their toxicity, for sure. So the plan is to use sector field ICPMS, so very, very high resolution work. Uh, use flow field flow fractionation to tear apart the dissolved particulate and colloidal phases and measure each one of these to see where the metals are and what state they're in, what valence state they're in. 
The challenge to date uh, with some of the work that has been done is most studies are, are analyzing at detection limits that are way too high to detect some of the elements that are actually in the environment. And so, so the plan is, uh, through Bill's, uh, Bill Schottick's lab, uh, is to uh, get down to parts per quadrillion on some of these uh, elements of interest. And, and so we can actually look at these for, uh, and, and actually detect them, because we know they're there, we're just not being able to detect them right now with the, uh, with the level of detection that's being used. The plan is also to look at some of these uh, metals and do, do the isotopes on them, like I mentioned to see if there are some characteristic differences between the, the different metals coming from different sources. Um, organics is, is, is key as well. Uh, Dr. John Martin and his group over in biological sciences have been, have been looking at this very, very closely and have actually probably, I would say, raised the bar on, and the level of understanding on organics originating from the oil sands and, and from the natural setting. Um, why do we need to look at these? Well, they're the toxic fraction of the oil sands produced water, um, but they're mixed up in this big um, mass of organic soup, or more or less, for lack of a better term, um, that can be really, really difficult to, to tear apart. Um, so profiling of these organics has been found to be a good indicator of, of source, whether it be biological sources like your natural humic and fulvic substances, fatty acids, or organic acids, these natural seeps going into the river and, and oil sands produce water. The, uh, the challenge here is that the oil sands produce water is a super complex mixture of, of, of organics. It has over 200,000 chemicals in there, uh, salts and metals, and when you're actually looking at that, when you run a, a, a GCMS or, or something of that nature and you, you get this big you know, profile, I mean, where do you start? It's just a big hump, and you have to try to identify certain things in there that it might even be lost underneath the big profile. So you need to be able to tear this apart. Natural discharges are also super, super complex. So, I mean, part of the reason why I think no one has actually found a definitive fingerprint for oil sands produced water in the oil sands to date, based on the organics, is because these two things look very, very similar when you analyze them certain ways. There are techniques that you can use to actually tear these apart. So when you look at you know, biological sources, you see the profile on this, so basically the carbon number and the uh, area ratio. Uh, we see that um, the oil sands produced water has a really similar looking profile to the natural seeps, although there's probably some subtleties in there that one can exploit and try to understand certain components that may be in an oil sands produced water as opposed to a natural surface water or, or something, uh, some, some other source. And this can be done using uh, high pressure liquid chromatography with an orbit trap. Um, I don't completely understand the technology and if you have any questions, Dr. Martin's in the back there. Uh, but long story short, it, it is looking for characteristic functional groups. Uh, we know that in naphthenic acids, a very, very characteristic functional group is the O2 group. And so what we see here is the oil sands produced water in blue here is very, very different from the surface water and the groundwater. So, so that's, that's good to know. But we can also look at sulfur-bearing compounds, and we also see some, something similar as well. We see that oil sands produced water can have some very, very characteristic uh, SO2 functional, or SO2, SO3, and SO4 functional groups on the organic molecules as well. So when you actually start fingerprinting this way, um, and you can start doing comparisons and ratios, you can actually start getting these, these fingerprints that you want. I am seeing oil sands produced water here. I'm not seeing it here, but I'm seeing something natural. And now you can start attributing flux from a source. Uh, this paper was, was published in Environmental Science and Technology by Matt Ross and, and the group. I was, uh, John was involved, I was involved, there was a host of others. But um, what was very interesting when, you know, what we're showing here is, is concentration, relative concentrations of, of uh, naphthenic acids based on the size of the circle and where they were collected, uh, whether they be pore waters or surface waters. What's very interesting is when you look at this, some of the highest concentrations are found nowhere near oil sands activities. So that's telling you, again, the natural system is playing a, a, a fairly significant role here. 
We also need to understand the biological significance. Um, and, you know, because, again, this comes down to toxicity and, and the organic fraction as well. It can have effects on fish. Um, and again, these natural seeps have a very, very similar profile. So we're, we're not quite there yet, and we're hoping with this study we will, we will eventually get there uh, to be able to, to attribute. But, but we need to understand the ecological and human health relevance of this in the end, right, to understand the risk of current and future development activity. Also evaluating the aquatic uh, ecosystem with respect to its health and using some biochemical indicators of metabolics and genomics. Uh, this is work that uh, Dr. Mark Poesh is going to be doing and his team, uh, looking at uh, mapping the migrations and the absorption characteristics of certain elements within fish, uh, measuring their inner ear bones and doing laser uh, ablation ICPMS work to profile. It's almost like tree rings. You can work your way from the center out and you can see how metals might accumulate within a, within a fish species over, over time. And looking at some metagenomics to understand the biodiversity of the aquatic uh, communities and see if there's differences between areas where there might be industrial seepage and where there's natural seepage. There may be no difference. I don't know. This is why we need to explore it. Um, I can tell you, you can't, I mean, you can't do any activity on the faces of the earth without having some sort of an influence. But it's the degree to, and the relevance of that influence that's really important to keep in mind. We need to project future states of water resources. This is the qual quantity side of it. Uh, with respect to climate vari variability and climate change, which are very different things. We need to be able to understand the availability of water, which is very different from the reliability of the water, right? We might have lots of water, but we might not have it when we need it and where we need it. So we need to look at these types of aspects because water, water is very important to, to the oil sands. Uh, we need to understand future water needs and water risks and, and, and so we can, we can manage this resource properly to ensure you know, the, the, the goals of sustainability, right? The, the, the social aspects, the, the environmental aspects, and the economic aspects, and try to, try to balance that if we can, if it's even possible. We know over time that uh, you know, climate phenomenon like the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, going in and through its positive and negative phases, has definite influences on the flow of the river at low flow periods. Um, people would have you, under, you know, believe that, you know, since 1975, the, the flow in the, in the Athabasca River has been decreasing over time. And, and if you project it out over time, we're going to run out of water and it's all going to be doom and gloom. And what's very interesting is prior to 1975, the flows were actually increasing. And so you need to, be, you need to look at a long enough period of record to understand what the historic variability is. Um, you can't be conveniently selecting pieces of time to look at to, to build an argument. We also know that the climate models are projecting uh, significant changes in snow water equivalent from the headwaters, anywhere from 47% decline to 66% decline. Most of the water in the, in the rivers of our province comes from the mountains, and it comes from snow melt. Upwards of 70 to 80% of the water that flows in the rivers is from snow. When the snow starts disappearing, that has significant influences on rivers. And so we need to keep that in mind. And, and we need to synthesize all this information into an understandable format. Print media, visual, so we can communicate to a broad audience. There's, there's a good story, a very interesting story to tell here. Um, and we need to be able to reach all levels of, of, of people, you know, from PhDs down to grade six, um, with this story. Because it's important for our province to, to really understand what, what is going on. Because decisions are going to be made 20 or 30 years from now. I'll be retired by then or maybe even gone. But other people are going to be making decisions. I'd like to get them some good information. Obviously backed up with technical reports and papers, peer-reviewed papers. It's very, very important to put it out in the community to have it vetted properly. And then develop a visual platform that, that can actually be put out into the public. So people can learn. We learn through looking at things and doing things. If we could provide a a GIS platform that interactive that people could go in and, and, and work with, that'd be great to try to bring, you know, the, you know de demystify the subsurface a bit and, and, and connect up these surface water and groundwater resources into a, in a holistic manner. So the end goal uh, and the benefits. Um, obviously, we need to resolve this question of human, it, human effects in the oil sands and the natural loading of the system because, and the relevance. This is very, very important 
going forward. We feel this, this work that we're going to do is going to provide a proper context to industry so they can manage properly, to the government so they can regulate properly, and to the public so they can benefit. Um, and if we're going to be doing things, we're doing them, you know, we're doing things for the right reason. This work is meant to inform regulations and policy regarding future development in the oil sands, uh, and more importantly, the closure activities, because we don't know what closure is going to look like down the road. And, uh, you know, we've got a 40-year history, um, but we don't have a lot of reclamation to, to work to go on yet. We're still learning. So this is just another piece of that learning um, in order to manage residual risks. And then this is meant to also assist the joint Alberta-Canada Oil Sands Monitoring Initiative uh, to develop robust monitoring in the oil sands area. So, you know, the thought would be if we've identified some of these, these discharge zones, we should probably be going there and, and putting in longer-term monitoring so we can understand the temporal dimension of how these, these seepages operate because they're probably not constant. They probably fluctuate over time. And we also need to know where to go to monitor and what to monitor for. So that's really important. This is the team. So I've been asked to, to take on a project management role, working with uh, directly with uh, Bill Shoddick as academic lead um, and reporting to the uh, Alberta Innovates Energy Environment Solutions uh, COSIA Consortium. We have Tracy Gardner, who's our pro uh, project administrator. She's kind of keeping us on the straight and narrow because, as you know, scientists can sometimes go sideways. Um, I'll be taking care of the physical setting, uh, so the geology, the hydrology, the hydrogeology and geochemistry, and trying to bring a lot of these pieces together, coordinating with the, the other team leads, so Bill Shoddick on trace elements, John Martin on the organics, and Mark Poesh on the aquatic health. Um, and then we've got uh, Tariq Sadiq, Dr. Sadiq, doing arsenic and selenium work, uh, Vincent St. Louis doing the mercury, and we've got Hugh McIsaacs from the University of Windsor, helping us out with the, uh, the genomics work. And each one of these have people beneath them as well, so this is quite the team involved. These are just kind of the PIs and, and immediate support. And the planned execution here is, 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 I mentioned earlier, to get the final agreements in place, which uh, we're hoping to have by uh, either the end of September or early into October where we would actually like to have a preliminary field program, so go out and, and gather some information this year, because as we get later into the year, it gets harder and harder to get onto the river. We run into ice issues and, and health and safety issues, and we, we're just not going to do that. We'd rather just push off into the next year. We do uh, plan on doing the geophysical reconnaissance uh, in the winter and spring of, of 2014, so we'll have those tributaries covered off. And then we can mount our, our uh, field programs to go out and actually do measurements and sample collections, both in the spring of 2014 and, and 2015. And then finally, uh, the goal is to document and communicate this work uh, by the end of June 2016. Hopefully along the way, there, there might be an opportunity to come back and give you guys an update on how this is going, um, what we're finding. Um, and uh, b before the end, because it's nice to, you know, to keep telling the story. So I, I really want to thank you very much. I, I, almost, I think I took up all the time here. But uh, um, if you have any questions, uh, maybe we've got a couple minutes. Uh, otherwise, I can stick around for, uh, for a few minutes afterwards, and we can uh, have a chat. So thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy your afternoon.